why should anyone study philosophy? Why did you want to study philosophy in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I certainly think people should. I think anybody should. I really think philosophy is mostly means just trying to understand your world, trying to understand your experience. And so, you know, at one level, we do that all the time when you just try to figure out what you want to do with your day or what you want to do with your life. But, you know, you can be more, more or less deep about that. Uh, but I think that the, the any time we put effort into trying to understand our situation more deeply, our lives become enriched. Um, and I think that the, the thing that I guess generally makes something be philosophy is that you're not just going to stop with the sort of superficial and ready-made answers, but you're, you're really going to try to keep investigating. You, you're going to think, well, why does that happen? Or does it have to be that way? And so on. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I think that kind of um, attempt to understand one uh, attempt to understand one's situation while also being prepared to be critical about the, sort of received views about it is, is, uh, just makes for a very, uh, enriched life. And then, and then there's the formal thing of philosophy, which is the history of three or thousand years, I guess, of people trying to answer really deep questions about in a very ultimate way. What is, what is our situation? You know, what is a human being? What is the world? Um, and you know, not everybody's going to go all the way through those questions, but, the study of those things and the study of the great works of our traditions, um, I think, it, again, just really uh, enriches and informs our lives. So, so I think people should study philosophy um, just because they will find that it helps them to become uh, more alive to the things that are going on around them and helps people to make better choices about how to how to interpret their own desires and wants, how to deal with other people and so on. And I, I think it's a, it's a permanently enriching thing. And the, it's a, it's a thing like, I mean, I've spent my whole life doing it. I think you can spend your whole life doing it. Yeah. I mean, that one, that makes me want to ask if a lot of philosophy is about studying and sort of trying to think and analyze more deeply our lives. Are we like, in a sense, all philosophers do in, in the conversations and deep conversations that we have with people and trying to understand things? Can we say that that's a form of philosophy? Yeah, I think I think that's that's a, that's quite an important connection. I think sometimes people imagine wrongly that philosophy is a separate specialized study. But I think the thing you just said is is right, that in, in a way we are all philosophers or the way I would put it is that what you're doing when you're studying philosophy is just developing a kind of desire and interest that anybody naturally has. And so we people are being philosophical all the time. But that doesn't mean they're always doing a great job of being philosophical all the time, but people are, are doing it. And so I think what I would say is people's lives are improved if they put effort into trying to do that well. Uh, you know, trying to, so thinking about your situation doesn't just mean making up your own ideas about it. You know, it means actually thinking about it and that uh, uh, the more deeply you want to go, the more that will take you into study. But I think the important thing is that whatever study one ends up doing in philosophy, if it's valuable, it's because it's developing a basic desire and a basic activity a desire we all have and a basic activity we all engage in. Um, and it, it, in fact, I think when that connection is lost, when people sometimes think of philosophy as having, you know, a, a set of, uh, I don't know, very abstract special doctrines or truths, that, that kind of philosophy wouldn't really be worth much. You know, when you sever the idea of philosophy from the living needs of people's lives, I think it's not worth much. But so, yeah, I think people mm -hmm. are all philosophers, but, but we aren't all deliberate about it and we aren't all good at it. So it's good to take that up and, you know, try to try to refine one's sense of thinking about one's life. That's helpful. That's interesting because that makes me think that philosophy is a, a skill. We can be bad. We can be good at it. Right. Rather than why do you think in, say, like current times, 
philosophy is seen as something which we don't do, that it's something that it's, it's other people do. It's very analytical. Um, why, why can't it be something that we feel we can participate in? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we live in a, we live in a world in the 21st century in which there are all kinds of highly developed, very specialized things. You know, there's highly developed computer science, highly developed uh, electrical engineering, highly developed uh, microbiology. You know, we, we live in a world of uh, all kinds of studies that have reached a very specialized and advanced state. And in a certain way, that's true of philosophy, too. So, you know, if you look up philosophy on the Internet or you look at philosophy in the store, you're going to find all kinds of books that are already written and you're going to find all these famous names. Like what did Plato say? What did Thomas Aquinas say? What did uh, Spinoza or Hegel or Marx say? And so like microbiology or or chemistry, that practice of trying to think deeply about our world to try to develop wise insights into what it is, uh, because it has a long history, people have made a lot of progress with that. And so I guess that would be another thing I could have said at the beginning. There's a great deal to learn in the history of those things. And so that's that's a reason why going to school or reading those books is a really great resource that will take you beyond what you just think out on your own. Um, but it means when, when you encounter that thing, it looks like, oh, that's a specialized field and you have to go learn all the specialized doctrines of those people. Uh, and so I, I think it, the, with, with philosophy, but also all fields, we just live in a world where those things are kind of, I guess you could say reified, right? They're trying to kind of treat it as if they're independent things. Um, and, uh, and I think it makes sense because, you know, when, when you, like I have a little son who's, uh, well, I guess he's not so little anymore. He's seven, but you know, when he was growing up, he, like he sees cars, governments, money, like there's just this stuff that's already there. And he just sort of encounters it and thinks, Oh, I guess, uh, this is just the way things is. And I'll have to learn about it or get used to it, but it doesn't really seem like it is something he could develop out of himself. And philosophy or chemistry mm -hmm. seem like that too. Um, and then I also think that people who are chemists or philosophers or medical doctors uh, often don't help because people, when they develop in those specialized fields, fields also can become kind of self-absorbed and talk about their fields in ways that only other people in those fields can talk about it. And there can be, they can be very proud of their accomplishment or even arrogant, you know? And so I think it's also the case that specialists can sometimes really give off an air that, um, you know, I have a special thing you, you can't have. So I, I think, I don't think there's anything unique to philosophy that makes it seem in that way, a little bit more alien and detached. I think it's it's uh, the state of all kinds of studies in our contemporary world. And indeed, just as I was saying earlier that I think philosophy should be understood as something that naturally grows out of all of us. I mean, I think that's true of chemistry and electrical engineering and government and economics and all those mm -hmm. things too. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, if I have a complaint, well, I do have complaints. I was, I was gonna say, if I have a complaint about the schools, uh, it's that uh, they often, uh, don't uh, bring out well enough the connection between the things that are being taught and the need, the, the, the idea that they're the living needs of people. And so, yeah, that is a complaint I often have. And I, I wish that uh, in all disciplines, uh, people would teach in a way that didn't uh, try to emphasize their discipline as a almost kind of sacred doctrine, you know, mm -hmm. but instead would, would try to make clear the, the, the way those studies are rooted in everyday needs of people. That's great because, because that makes me think, for example, in economics, people say, you know, you're, you know, you're an economist, Jack, and I don't, I don't know anything about it and I wouldn't deign to, to speak about it. I'm like, no, I'm just a normal person. I'm an idiot. I don't know econo economics either. Right. And I like, and I like, uh, I love talking about it. Um, and, and I agree, especially in this field as well, right? People like to espouse their own, their own ways of thinking. And these are the right ways of thinking as well. One point I wanted to touch on is you talk about how 
you know, your child comes into the world and there are already these things, right? Governments and these really complex things. So it does make sense too that there are these specialized ways of thinking, right? We, in a sense, have to um, sort of take uh, that's it's it's making me think of your your book bearing witness to epiphany we're constantly right being thrown into the world and having to absorb and go into the things that that are already there so well one way to go 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 off of this if you have no comment on that is like why don't we how does one learn philosophy i mean one one question i wonder whether you should go down your your philosophy like what is it to you and the books you've written or how would one learn philosophy? Is there like a specific philosophy that one should, one should go yep. to as a way into it? Yeah. I mean, let me pick up on the first thing you said first about the way that, you know, children are just sort of thrown into the world. And, and um, you know, we, we all grew up with a kind of rough and ready way of figuring out how to, how to deal with these things. It's like if you, uh, if you get on a horse, you kind of have to figure out how to ride it. And that's kind of what you're doing with everything. You're learning how to ride downtown life and how to ride living in a political society and how to ride using money and so on. And that doesn't, that typically doesn't mean going deep into those things and understanding where they came from and understanding their principles. It's much more, mm -hmm. much more practical thing of learning how to navigate with them. Um, and that's a great thing, but, it, but it means we, we all, like, if you, if you function in contemporary life, you've learned an incredible amount, right? People know extremely well, practically how to engage meaningfully with all kinds of things, but often our reflective thought about those things doesn't keep up with that, right? Often our understandings of the very things we deal with. Uh, are kind of out of step with that. And uh, so I think a good place to start, you were saying, so, th so, so there I was saying something about how we all kind of learn by being thrown into things. And then you were asking about, you know, how to get into philosophy. Well, I think a good place to start is just by noticing about yourself, about oneself that, mm -hmm. wow, I use money and I don't really know what money is. Uh, I talk about which political party I like, but I don't really understand how government works and why it exists, you know, like going through things or even families, like you live with your family and you think, oh yeah, I love my family or I don't love my family as the case may be. But then you mm. might think, wait, why are families and why are, why do families exist and what exactly are they? Like you might think about any of these things or indeed about yourself. What am I, you know, what kind of thing is a person uh, just stopping to notice the that gap between the realities you live with in a familiar and comfortable way and your actual explicit understanding of those things that's a very powerful way to get into philosophy because that's when you start noticing oh there are things to understand here and there are questions to ask here i mean there are of course other ways to get into philosophy too like sometimes you already have a question you want to you you ask yourself Oh, I want to know how to be a good person. And so you start thinking about what is good behavior or, or mm. a, a different way into that same question about government. You might think, well, I do want to re vote for the right party, but I realize I don't know enough about the issues or something like there can be ways that we have mm. already had questions arise for us that we start pursuing. But I think that at, at the deepest level, philosophy is about trying to understand at a basic level, what kind of thing we are as people and what kind of thing our world is. And so it's when you start to notice that you don't already really understand those things. I think that things really, uh, that, that, uh, an interest in philosophy can really grow and develop. Um, and I mean, I guess that's a thing that happens in school, like going back to that earlier point, sometimes you go to school and you'll read some famous philosopher, like, I don't know, Descartes or Marx or something. And that person, the, the book you'll be reading is full of really rich and great insights about knowledge or what it is to be a person or how economics works or whatever. Um, uh, but when you read that stuff as a student, it just seems like a bunch of sort of not very interesting claims to you because mm -hmm. you haven't yourself already activated your questioning of that issue, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, 
so that's why I say I think if you can if you can find already a sort of recognize things that are important to you that you don't really understand and that can provoke you to kind of wonder about just what are they well then that's what's going to make these things go that's these studies sort of go well and develop um, in my own case I think, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know where my interest came from, but I know I, my dad was a psychiatrist and he was very, uh, very interested in, very concerned about people's healthy and happy mental lives. And so he had spent a lot of time thinking about how people make meaningful lives for themselves. And I think he, he was uh, doing that, you know, in the night, starting in the 1940s, 40s and 50s and 60s. And uh, I think he was influenced in that when he was studying, I think he was influenced by a lot of psychologists who were bringing ideas from existentialism, 20th century philosophical movement into their thought. Um, and so I think through him, just through him talking with me as I was growing up, I, you know, you get interested in what your parents are interested in often. And, and so I was interested in those questions about what makes a happy and healthy mental life too. And, and some kind of existentialist ideas that you might get from Sartre or Heidegger were filtered in there. I don't think my dad knew that that's where they were coming from. I mean, I know that now because I studied those mm -hmm. guys, but I think I was sort of growing up uh, with someone who was himself really asking pretty deep questions about, you know, what is a person and what makes a life meaningful? And so I got used to that. And uh, so for me, it was always very natural to move on with these things. And, uh, you know, when I went to university, I didn't, I actually, I thought maybe I would be a math teacher or maybe I would study history or something. I didn't know what. Um, and I just, you know, one of the courses I took was a philosophy course. And I hadn't actually been expecting it to be that interesting because, I mean, I wasn't opposed to the idea of philosophy, but I mostly imagined philosophy just meant, you know, being philosophical, like thinking about stuff. And I thought, well, what are they going to teach you in school about that? They're going to say, you know, you should think about stuff. So what was actually pretty interesting and, and a bit shocking to me was when I went to that class, I think I was already being kind of philosophical. And then I read these books by Plato. We read Plato, Descartes, Hume, and William James, as I recall. And they really blew my mind. They were Because I, I never would have thought of those things. And they were amazingly powerful books like they had such uh, engaging and exciting thrilling ideas thrilling insights and because i had already been asking you know philosophical questions to myself these things really spoke to me so i think that's what then got me to think well maybe i'll take one more of those classes and i really like plato so i took another class in ancient philosophy i didn't i didn't intend to keep studying i just thought oh yeah well, I didn't think that first class was going to be much, but it was pretty good. So I'll do one more. And then that one was really great too. And then I thought, okay, maybe I'll do one more. And then that just never stopped. Uh -huh. But, uh, uh, but I, but yeah, so I think, I think the, I guess putting those two things together is the best way into philosophy to raise on your, or develop on your own, a kind of recognition of the lots of ways in which you're really sort of ignorant or you don't really quite understand what it is you're already doing in many important sectors of your life and become interested in figuring those things out better and then in conjunction with that when you read great insightful works you know a kind of dialogue develops between you and those great books and that's when mm -hmm. philosophical education really really soars thank you I, I like you talking there about your own experience and your own involvement involvement with it that's great as well, personally, I like what you said there as well, because in reading many different topics and also quite deep topics, but not really going into philosophy in turning a little bit to it recently, I'm realizing it's, it's people thinking as almost as deeply as they can about the world. And in that sense, it's kind of, uh, for me, like a, now a kind of untappable source of riches because I'm like, oh, it doesn't feel like I can go deep enough. I'm having to read things out loud. I'm having to like think deeply about it. And sometimes it's a bit annoying because maybe I'll spend like a while on a small <laughs> book and I can't tell my friends where I read, you know, these, these, those volumes and I can tell you all my facts about, about the, about the economy now, or whatever. So, well, we've talked all about why we should study philosophy and an overview of what it is. I wonder if it would be a reasonable point to kind of go into some, almost like the tools and the ways that we could actually think about the world. Yeah. 
I know your philosophy thinks about like the lived experience a lot. I and literally change the question if you don't think it's a good starting place. But in your book, Bearing Wit Witness to Epiphany, part of your uh, philosophy you propose is that reality is music like. I wonder if that's in that, oh, yeah. uh, something you can touch on. Is that a nice place to, to, to sort of step into yeah. this? That is a nice place, partially because um, when you were talking uh, about your own experience of reading things and sort of the sometimes frustrating way that that means you, you don't suddenly have a thing you can turn around and tell someone, you know, exactly, here's what I just learned, you know, I actually started thinking about music and, and uh, art and so on. So that, I think it's a great question. Um, let, let me say the thing I was thinking. Um, mm -hmm. I think that learning, learning philosophy is a lot like learning music. You know, like, like I said about philosophy, I think music is a thing that's, or artistic practice in general is a thing that's natural to anybody. So, you know, little kids are very artistic. People, people of any age are musical, but we might or might not develop that very much. But it's a, but it's a, a sort of a, a, a kind of openness we all have in us, generally speaking, mm -hmm. and a thing we can work with. Um, and, and actually, I'll say one more thing. Like, I think musical education, again, can be a thing that's just a drag because whereas, you know, children are often sort of naturally kind of musical they suddenly get put into the setting where they get forced to practice a whole bunch of things based on some you know royal conservatory list of things you're supposed to do and, and it just seems alien like the thing they're learning doesn't really connect with their own developing sense of what music is um but and so that's where things can often go astray but when people really are becoming musical or you know developing their ability in music not necessarily through those kinds of conservatory courses, but through, like you know, learning how to play guitar and singing songs with their friends and gradually advancing. Uh, what you find is, I think, you can have you can have a, a real native interest in it, and you can pretty quickly find things that speak to that native interest, whether it's listening to songs you like or learning how to play some simple songs. But a natural thing that then happens is people think, oh, I want to. If they're playing, they think I want to get better at this. And those steps of getting better, uh, this is kind of the parallel to, you know, studying philosophy, like the steps of getting better don't automatically mean that if you sit down and practice your guitar for an hour, you're going to suddenly sound like a different guitar player, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when people start getting seriously into their musical study, uh, they work on things that are important, but they don't always turn around and immediately produce a kind of re result you could show another person. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as you're reading these philosophy books, they're, you know, presumably, you know, getting thoughts turning around in your head, making you notice different things in your environment, uh, you know, all, all kinds of things. But that doesn't mean you're suddenly going to be able to tell your friends, here are the five new important facts I learned that you can take away. It's more mm -hmm. that those books sort of set you down a path and you're now going to work on that for a while until you gradually digest it. And even at the end of that digestion period, you might or might not be able to turn around and hand somebody a new fact. But if, if you did really learn something, what it probably will mean is you relate to relate to situations differently because you think in terms of different issues or something like that. Just as with music, you can practice these things that don't immediately translate into a great new song that somebody's going to like or something like that. But you practice for a while and you become a better musician, both better able to handle your instrument, but you have a deeper sense of what it is you're doing. Um, uh, anyway, so that was, I'll, I'll, I'll now get onto your actual question, but that was the thing I wanted to say about just about learning and the sort of parallel but but so the the reason that i use music at the beginning of bearing witness to epiphany as a kind of model for thinking about our relationship to reality is that i think um learning about the world is an awful lot like listening to a tune you know so i think if um Sometimes you can hear music, like when you're a kid again, you can hear music that's not the sort of stuff you're used to. And you don't you don't exactly hear the music in it. You hear some sounds and you know your mom likes it or something like that. But 
it's not it's not uh, musically gripping to you you know so like little, little kids often like songs with a very simple beat and a very simple melody but if they had to listen to um oh, an orchestra performing a classical piece or uh jazz saxophone solo like it's just you know it doesn't they think ah, if they even if they even treat it as an it it's going to be boring but it's probably almost mm -hmm. more like noise to them um uh, so the, the reason I want to, or sometimes music from another culture can be like that too. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason that I wanted to pick that is I want you, you be, to be able to think about like a kind of example of where you hear something and you can recognize that, oh yeah, a person really could hear the music there. And yet it's very understandable that a little kid or something doesn't, right? Because that's a real mm -hmm. situation we have where there, where we, there is something that kind of makes sense and is very gripping, but you're not really in a position to notice it yet. But then, if, you know, like, so if I'll say about myself too, I mean, at a certain point I played guitar and, you know, I'd sort of heard about jazz. I didn't really know what it was, but I thought, well, I should find out what that is. And so I went and bought some records from the jazz section um, and brought them home and listened to it. And then one thing in particular I brought home was uh, Charlie Parker's um, music from the 1940s. And I put the record on and I thought, what is this? It's just, it's just weird little scratchy, squeaky. Uh, I mean, it's better than that, but I mean, it just, it just sounded like, um, I didn't, I couldn't even say what it sounded like. It just yeah. sounded like noises kind of noodling around. Now I love it, but then I didn't, I didn't, it didn't make any sense, but you know, I listened to it over and over again and, as I listened and as I, you know, did other things, I gradually got to a point where it was like, oh yeah, I realize I've got used to that now and I can hear it and I can appreciate it. Um, well, that it seems to me is kind of a good model for what learning is like. You know, you, when you, not, not just of music, but in, of the world, of reality. When you're, you're in an unfamiliar situation, stuff is just uh, in a certain way meaningless to you, even though, the stuff around you makes a lot of sense. You're not really in a position to grasp that sense. But if you spend time engaging with it, its sense will kind of just start making itself clear to you the same way the musicality of a piece will. In fact, I was saying that earlier when I was talking about, you know, how we grow up in the world and we learn sort of how to ride a horse or how to ride, so to speak, downtown life or something. That's, that's really that point that human beings, the kinds of things we are, are just amazing for that reason that you can put us in a situation. And if we spend time just interacting with it, it will happen that at a certain point we'll kind of get it, you know, and, uh, but it doesn't mean we'll have a theoretical understanding that we could express to someone. It means that in a practical way, we kind of learn how to navigate that thing, how to write it. And so in that way, so that's, that's one way then in which uh, engaging meaningfully with reality and understanding what it is, is kind of like listening to music. And I would say one other, another point about that is that um, uh, our, when we think about the situations that we're in, like living in a city or, yeah, living in contemporary society or whatever, there are all kinds of different sort of um, layers of what's going on. Like you have to learn, uh, like in, I live in a house and I have neighbors. You got to learn about neighbors, and you got to learn about the difference between the street where the cars drive past and the sidewalks where the people walk, and the dis division between those public sidewalks and streets and our front yard. You know, and you've got to learn about. Um, laws that the police might enforce. And that's a little different from sort of rules of behavior that where people kind of expect you to behave in the right way, but the police aren't going to stop you, but people aren't going to like you if you're mm -hmm. sort of rude or disrespectful, like just right there, like I've named, you know, half a dozen different important distinctions. Uh, without ever really thinking about them, we all learn to make those distinctions by engaging with the world. And as, as we then start to say, like I say, okay, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go down to buy a cup of coffee and then 
buy some groceries or something. You know, you just engage in your daily task. And all you think about is that task. But to carry out that task, you also have to know how to navigate private property and public space, roads versus mm. sidewalks, obey the laws. And so I think that our simple everyday actions, like buying groceries, are themselves always embedded in really quite rich and complex situations. And uh, getting through an activity is both dealing with that specific thing you're trying to do and navigating well all those things that make up the context. And so I, I think of, that's a good comparison to dealing with something like the melody and the harmony in a musical piece, like in a musical piece, the thing you might notice is the singable tune. But the reason it's really gripping to you is because of all the other stuff people are playing that contextualizes it and harmonizes it. And mm -hmm. so I think another way in which dealing with a situation, dealing with your real situation is like dealing with music is that just as music is structured in terms of the uh, explicit melody and the kind of implicit harmony so is our so is the the meaning of our everyday world and then one more like music also has rhythm you know like it's it's got a beat and so on and and the music sounds good because the sounds you hear are placed at the right spot in the beat and so on but i think our daily lives are like that too like we have uh not in the sense that someone's tapping out a pulse you know do 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 do, do like that but in the sense that we have kind of rhythms we respond to of like um, a very basic one would be sleeping and waking, but there are rhythms that we deal with over the course of the day and things really only feel right to us if, if they happen at the right time and at the right pace. And so I think often we only notice that thing I was calling the melody, like I want to go buy a cup of coffee. But engaging with reality isn't just that, it's also engaging with all those other dimensions that kind of are I'm calling sort of the harmony of our experience and also engaging with those things that are often very personal and psychological, the kind of rhythms that our experiences is, is uh, uh, responding to rhythms in us. And it's all of those things together, matching the rhythms with the harmony, with the sort of specific melodic actions that make up the meaning of the world. Uh, of our of our world that we deal with mm. so that's so wanna, those would be some of the ways go ahead go ahead i basically want to just just jump in and say like because you were talking about like a, a child maybe they listen to music and like it doesn't really grip them right so it's, it's you know or you were listening to music and then only later on the the same music sort of becomes something different it makes me and like let me know if this makes sense if i'm thinking about the world as musical and rhythm harmony melody you know if you're if a child you know they see an adult like drinking a cup of coffee right that's like right. a kind of a that's a kind of a melody, right? And it's something you do, but to the child, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just a weird thing right. adult does because, right? In a way, like the harmony, harmony and the the rhythm of, of the adult's life. That that in that context, the the cup of coffee makes loads of sense, and it it comes and like creates. The reason I want to say that is just because like it's I wanted to bring it back to thinking about like I like the example of a child listening to music, and it doesn't mean anything because as a child, like. You're constantly experiencing like that's it's you know that's it's so weird why they're doing this and that but then you go into mm -hmm. an adult and you're oh like it becomes the world that you live in um i kind of stopped you there but yeah but yeah well that's okay that's a great point and what you said actually reminded me of one little thing i could say that that may be helpful there um that i think is important and that is that i think for all of us the real way that our experience is meaningful is that it it has a structure of question and answer and the things that we experience are as meaningful are things that we're experiencing as answers to questions that we're asking and so this example you just gave about the child is uh, you know in, in the in the sort of images i was using before the child doesn't really have the sort of harmony and rhythm that would make that melody make sense, as you said. Mm -hmm. Another way you could say a similar thing is the child isn't really asking the questions of its life and of its world that the adult is to which doing this thing now would be a fitting and appropriate answer. So like, that's why the child like can't, can't really mm -hmm. see like, why would you want to do that? 
you know, because right. the why isn't really alive in them yet. And anyway, I think I, the, re the reason I especially wanted to say that is because I do think that idea of thinking about our experience in terms of question and answer can be really illuminating. Like in our own cases, I, well, actually, let me say one more thing first to, to make sense of that. I think we often act about ourselves as if we're just seeing something obvious. You know, you look around and you see people and it's a city street and blah, blah, blah. It's a nice day. Like the ways we would describe our situation, we tend to think of as just factual descriptions of what is presented to us. And what we don't recognize is that the way those things appear to us is deeply responsive to, deeply rooted in the kinds of concerns and expectations and so on that we bring, right? And so the child doesn't bring a certain set of concerns and expectations. And so the situation doesn't just doesn't look like a situation where you need a cup of coffee or something like that. Mm -hmm. But but at virtually all of the things we take to be just factual perceptions, there's a kind of background, a kind of harmony and rhythm, right? A kind of background of expectations or something uh, that's letting that thing appear meaningfully in the way it does that we often don't notice. And so I think it's a very, a very powerful move to ask ourselves, what is the question I must have been asking such that that seemed like an answer, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, even, even if you just, if you say, if somebody else um, irritates you, you're, what you're going to say is that person was irritating and you'll treat it as a factual description of that person mm -hmm. where you could say, what, what was I bringing to the situation in the form of expectations such that that thing that happened I now experience as an irritation. Now, so it doesn't mean you're wrong to think that that person's being a jerk, but sometimes you do you do realize, oh, the fact of my being irritated reflects more about me than about her or him, you know? And that that can be true in all kinds of situations that when we when we turn to ask you know, what was I bringing? What was I open to? What was I looking for? What was I expecting? When we start turning to that and analyzing what ourselves, analyzing what we are bringing, when we notice that explicitly, instead of just taking it for granted, that can often have a really transformative effect, a very healthy one on how we relate to situations. Sometimes we learn uh, that we are bringing, you know, bad expectations, you know, and so we're with, with the result that we accuse people of being nasty to us or whatever, when it's really about us. But sometimes it's not that sometimes, you know, you might think, why, why did I feel bad after that encounter? Like, the person was being polite, they said, yes, thank you, we said, seem to say nice things. Um, sometimes if you investigate your own thing, you can realize, oh, I would, I actually come to situations expecting people are going to take my point of view seriously. And when I look at that situation, I realize that even though the person appeared to be being polite and so on, really everything they did was sort of ignoring my perception or my interests, right? So sometimes when we look back at ourselves, we can see why we had an ex expectation and it wasn't really being met. And, you know, and that's why something didn't feel right, but it might lead us to think, oh, I should take that more seriously. And instead of just thinking that person was nice and polite, I should maybe be more critical of that person, you know? So, so turning, mm -hmm. so, so thinking in terms of question and answer and, in, and, and, and instead of just, treating your experience as straightforward, factual experiences, but looking back to seeing what kind of context of expectations we bring can be very illuminating uh, for helping us to understand better how we are and aren't meshing with the world effectively. And it can bring about a lot of 
change. Anyway, that was me just riffing on that question yeah, and answer no, thing, but I, I no, thought that was helpful. No, that, that's good. In when you talk about question and answer, like, you know, your friend, the answer, your friend was a, a jerk, right? That's the answer you got, but it's don't, it can only seem like a jerk to you because you had the sort of a question and imposed like, I am the kind of person that has some expectations and, and, you know, you were, you were joking this instance because, you know, you transgress against this and that. And so does this link to like call and response in, in music, yeah. the way in, the way in which like we like, like, like again, maybe, um, the, an adult drinking a cup of coffee again, there is a kind of a call as an adult in that situation, yeah. the, the coffee cup is enticing, right? It's the kind of thing you do at yeah. a certain break, but for a child in their life that there is no, that the, the coffee cup doesn't really answer anything for them. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a great point. And, uh, and uh, let me add something to that. Like I, again, I think, I think often when we think about ourselves and our own actions, we imagine ourselves to be choosing and deciding what we're doing, you know, and odd as it might sound, that's, that's often not really true. Like when, like right now, when I'm talking to you, you know, I move my hands around and stuff. And I don't think about that. That's just kind of what automatically happens to me. And so my hands moving is, is this way I've developed as kind of responding to how a conversational situation feels to me. And without even thinking about it, just getting wrapped up in a conversation I'm engaged with means, you know, I'll start gesticulating. Um, well, similarly, as you said, with the coffee cup, like you can be sitting talking with a friend and without even thinking about it, you know, your hand goes out, picks up the coffee cup, you take it to your mouth, you have a drink, you put it back down. You might never even notice that happened. It's, it's more like the, just this again, sort of the musical analogy is it's sort of as the scene as a situation flows along, like a music flows along, that just seems like the natural next thing to do. And you kind of do it. And I think a lot of the things we do in our lives are like that. There are, our relationship to our situation is so familiar, but also so built up. Like we've, like I was saying before about learning the distinction between public space and private property, you learn the difference between the road and the sidewalk, like, We've learned so much stuff, but we've learned it at the level of sort of habit and we're really familiar with it. And what it means is as we walk through a situation, we automatically respond to kind of the cues that different aspects of our situation give us without even noticing that we do it. So in that way, the, our ongoing action is a kind of call and response. The situation calls for something, I respond this way. Uh, and so I think that that is very much a thing that happens. And, uh, and so yes, thinking in terms of question and answer is like thinking in terms of that it's, it's like learning. It's like, going back to the questions is going back to learning. How did this situation in me get set up, such that I automatically respond this way when a situation seems to, you know, call, call why does the situation call this up from me and so on? Um, and I do think that that's, again, you're right, that that's helpful to think of in terms of music, because, because you, you can hear that in music where one thing is done, one musical gesture is made, and the next one that follows, you can hear as kind of a musical and almost natural response to that last one. And so the way that the unfolding parts of the music can seem to be linked together in a kind of call and response pattern is is again a really um helpful way to notice the kind of structure that our ongoing action takes in the world and a structure that we often don't notice right so that's that's what i meant then when i was saying that we often think we're choosing our actions but in a way we often it's almost like we're on autopilot and and the things we do just kind of naturally roll along as the situation rolls along and we don't even under we don't even notice or understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. So kind of yeah. Like, so I think call and response is good. Yeah. Or oh, that that just makes me think kind of like like if if certain the chord sequences in music are playing like certain notes from those those chords are, are naturally going to be played, then you're like, oh, I didn't really choose to play notes in that chord sequence, but nothing else really felt felt right at all. And yeah. you naturally, if you don't actively try and change something, those naturally come about. Well. I, I've loved this going into 
sort of reality and our world being like music. Yep. I wonder what we could, we, 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 we've been learning from it um, and this has been great, but I wonder in, in your book, Bearing Witness to Epiphany, it, you talk a lot about ethics and mm -hmm. how the world kind of calls us to do certain things and the way in which we co-create it. I want, I want to maybe ask, what is this ethical responsibility? What is responsibility yep. to you in this framework? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I think the, the biggest, the biggest issue there is the, is the issue of other people. Uh, so, um, again, going back to this kind of question of call and response, I guess I'm, I, the, the, the thought or the question that lies behind my thought about ethics is what does the experience of another person call for? What kind of response does it call for? Something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we think about what another person is, like you could take a photograph of a person that looks like a photograph of a house or a photograph of a dog in the sense that it's just a, th a thing in the world with recognizable spatial contours and so on. And so when we think about what other people are, we often think of them that way, like just, oh, another body out there, another thing. But, but I don't think that captures what person means. And I don't think it captures what's happening to us when we recognize another person. So, you know, if I, if I'm in a store and, uh, uh, I thought I was standing beside a mannequin and suddenly it moves and I realize it's a person or the other way around mm -hmm. when I turn and say, Oh, excuse me. And then I realize it's a mannequin, right? You can, you can have those experiences either way of, uh, uh, imagining one thing was either a, just a just a mannequin or a person, then finding out it's the opposite. Those experiences, I think, are helpful for highlighting what has to be there for you to really say, "Oh, it's not just a mannequin; it's a person." And I think the I think the key to what makes us experience something as another person, or, or let me say that a little differently, I think what we are noticing when we notice another person is that that other person like ourselves is a perspective <laughs> excuse me um that other person is a perspective uh and that means they have a kind of inner life they have values they have goals all that sort of stuff and uh so any time you're walking around and you say there's another person, it seems to me you've already recognized that about them, right? So I think in recognizing other people, we, ha we have already acknowledged that's a person with as much independent worthiness to be respected as we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think ethics kind of grows out of that ethics is really the question of whether you're going to be honest about what you're already experiencing it's not some new special thing that, but the fact is just in recognizing another person it seems to me you have already had to recognize that's a person i have to treat with care and respect and so the question is really are is just are you going to act in a way that uh is honest about what you've already experienced, you know? And I think, uh, so I think, I think whenever we experience other people, we already are feeling a call of a, of a certain kind, right? We, we are already feeling, um, a kind of pressure being put on us by our world, or, or I should say by our own experience that's sort of saying, respect that thing, uh, acknowledge boundaries, be kind. We can work against that for all kinds of reasons. Um, uh, but, uh, but it's not like somebody has to prove to you that other people are morally meaningful. Like that's, that's already there in that experience. And so I think, mm. um, learning. So, so I think for me, moral responsibility is uh holding yourself really answerable to that thing that you already feel and but then 
knowing what to do to treat a person with respect is takes a little bit more work like it's like learning how to play music or anything else like other people well i, I guess i could just say you got to learn how to deal with other people and find out you know what it's like to encounter another people's wants and needs and then and one of the things you learn is that individual people have different wants and needs and so you can't just uh there's not like a blanket answer. Here's the right thing to do to another person. Like you can say in a blanket way, the right thing to do is to respect them. But then you say, well, how do I respect them? And that takes a different answer in relationship to different people. And you've got to learn to um, sort of be responsive to individuals. Uh, and that's that's a bit of a skill and a, and a bit of development. But anyway, so that's 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 me trying to talk about where what I think, where I think moral or ethical responsibility is rooted and how I think that's part of that same issue of learning to respond to the things in our experience that are already kind of prompting us or calling us. Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be right to say that with other persons rather than other objects and other events in our lives, other people are also agents to which reality is also like music? something like that so so they are music yeah. they are kind of they form they form our lives but to them life is also the same kind of strange experience that it is for you well yeah that's that, that's a very go, good go point on, and so, yeah. were, were you going to say something further no if you have something to say go go for it well the thing i was going to say there is I, I think that's a great point and you know with um uh when you're hanging around with your friends who you're really familiar with and you guys get along really well you guys probably have a lot of that kind of harmony and rhythm in common and so when you see something happen your friend probably sees it the same way mm -hmm. and that's where you can really get caught up in that false view that you're just seeing things the way they are and you don't realize that your own uh, expectations are shaping it and so you start hanging around with your friends and you start thinking any normal person would see the situation this way. And the tr but the truth is, as you've said, you've got to realize that any other person is grappling with these issues of melody, harmony, and rhythm, and so on. And many people have been brought up or developed lives that sort of harmonize things differently. And so in a, in a particular exchange you have with someone in the world, you got to realize how that looked to me it may not be the same as how it looked to them because for me it was part of this song but for them it was part of that song you know and so th that mm -hmm. that issue comes up when you move from your your group of intimate friends or maybe your family to group of people groups of people who are not so close to you but maybe in your same society but then that issue comes up even uh, in a bigger way when you move outside of your society to a different society in a different part of the earth or to a different historical period or something. So yes, I think that's a really big part of ethical and, and ultimately political responsibility is to learn to, to learn that you have to learn uh, what is the way this situation is being contextualized for those other people that's different from the way it's contextualized for me, uh, which means learning not to assume that what seems obvious to you in a situation would be obvious to anybody, right? It's obvious to you because of your developed familiarities, because of how you have come to appreciate the harmony and rhythm of things. But other people can be bringing very different expectations, very different harmonies and rhythms to those things. And it, yeah, you to really connect with another person and interact with them in a way that is respectful and meaningful will mean exactly as you say, learning that they're having that same kind of musical relationship too. And you can't really connect with them until you start to grasp you know how it's musical to them something like that mm -hmm. thank you there's more to say on on these topics we've we've just kind of touched on that but i i had a question that i 
just intrigued by and maybe will relate to what we've been talking about here. And that is, uh, what is something like anxiety in this oh, yeah. framework? Is it possible to think about it? Because in, when you have a series yep. on Heidegger and you talk about the way in which anxiety is a way in which we become kind of detached from the world and you can't really get into anything, like perhaps one could say like in, a, in the musical sense, nothing really kind of calls to us or yep. we don't feel exactly. driven. The world doesn't call to us in that same way. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, that's a good yeah. question. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, from the beginning when we were talking about philosophy up to this point, you know, I've been really coming back to this idea of sort of turning away from your familiar understanding of the world and sort of focusing on yourself and trying to understand what's going on in you. And, uh, you know, I was just saying that here about dealing with peop another person or somebody from another culture or something that you need to recognize your own interpretive biases, you might say, and try to understand what they're bringing. Um, but if you do that, you're actually turning to the things in you that that make your situation meaningful. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you've learned how your family does things as a little kid, like you, you're in this baffling world, and things start to work when you start to learn your family's ways of doing things, or you're, you're growing up in this city and things start to work when you learn how that city works. So developing all those expectations, all that harmony is what then lets your world be meaningful. But if you're turning around and questioning them and you're no longer assuming they're going to be the right way to think about things, in a way, what you're doing is sort of disassembling the, mm. the, the very meaningfulness of your world, the very way everything wow. worked. And so I think that process of self-questioning, like I, I guess that point at which you realize, oh, maybe things don't have to be seen that way, or maybe the way I'm living isn't the way it has to be. Like it can happen from different angles, but that, that experience, the experience of truly trying to be philosophical and raising questions about your life can be psychologically undermining. Like you can really feel like, wow, what I've done is I've taken away all those things that let me used to let me feel secure and comfortable. Maybe I'm learning something, but suddenly I feel lost and everything seems meaning, meaningless, you know? I mean, a similar example, just yeah. to uh, jump out for a second, sure. would be like if you break up with someone, when you're, when you're in a relationship with someone, that relationship becomes the harmony of your life. Like, in other words, mm -hmm. everything you do is contextualized by that assumed bond you have with that person and when you break up sometimes you feel like nothing in the world makes sense or is even engaging anymore because without that other person there to engage with those things like this it, stuff thing, seems dead well that's kind of an analogous thing that happens can happen in in philosophical questioning mm -hmm. uh when you're really turning to yourself, it's kind of like you're breaking up with someone. You're breaking up with all the habits and expectations you've been dating all your life, you know? Um, and it can be very undermining. Or, or I mean, undermining might not, might not be quite the right word, but, I mean, it could feel that way. But but really, I just mean it can pull the, pull the ground out from under you and leave you feeling like, I don't know which way to turn, and that can be very uncomfortable. But I think that we we can experience we can see that and we can think oh something must be going wrong here i feel i feel bad whereas i think that's not the case that that experience of anxiety i think is more like a door opening it's more like uh the first encounter of with yourself in a way it's that first encounter with you living in a way where you're going to be alive to all these ways in which you kind of have made your world meaningful. What I mean, it really means you're going to be alive to your freedom. It's going to be, you're going to be alive to your power to interpret and make sense of things. And so I think that I, I don't think that that anxiety is exactly a bad thing. And I, therefore I don't think it's exactly something that's going to go away. I think becoming wiser and more mature in in the way i'm talking about 
really means learning to inhabit that world or learning to inhabit a world where those questions aren't all answered already, right? Learning to inhabit a world where you realize that the way people do things, the way people do things, that's right, that's English. The way people do things might not be the only way people can do things. Um, you can learn to live in a world where you're more consistently animated by questions and where you have doubts and where things remain kind of open. Uh, so in that way, so, so those very experiences that can make you feel anxious and awful can be experiences that don't make you feel anxious and awful, right? So I think one thing about anxiety then yeah, is not yeah. just that you got to get rid of it. It's sometimes it's like, that's the first encounter with something that when you get used to living as a person who experiences his or her own freedom and, and uh, thinks for themselves and so on, you can inhabit that world more comfortably. Um, so I don't know if that's quite what you were after, but that's yeah. one way I would connect this with anxiety. That's, that's really helpful. I mean, I have one comment and maybe a question to that. I mean, one thing to say would be, do you think it's right to say that in a way we can kind of, we have the ability to create new music in our, our lives for ourselves, but because reality is music like, if we try and undermine and change its um, score, its melody, its harmonies, we can actually undermine that through which and by which we're living, right? So it's almost like a balance, you know, mm -hmm. you need you need something for something to be to be meaningful. And that just makes me want to ask one follow up question, which is, yeah, you know, in a, in a state where where um, one is like, like, for example, you give an example when you do that series in Heidegger of someone who they not, nothing, or, you know, just example you gave of you've broken up with someone and now like the the breakfast you're having is not the same thing and it doesn't really mean anything and 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 so in, in a state where you know you have like you know anxiety across your whole life right imagine someone did is is mm -hmm. that like there's no kind of music and how, how would one like you know build up new music you know what yeah was is there something I different guess... going on there or is there some other kind of thing i think no I, that's a great a great uh question and, and the things you said about it, I think are quite right. I guess it's a little bit, my answer would be a little bit like what I was saying about ethics. You know, when you deal with another person, it seems to me dealing with that person ethically really means approaching them with, you know, care and respect, but also realizing you kind of have to learn from them what, how they need you to interact with them, you know, and that's in contrast to thinking, oh, I have a book that tells me the 10 things I'm supposed to do that will be correct, right? I think I think ethics is not a matter of applying fixed rules to a person, but rather learning from that person how you need to behave. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, and let me say one more thing about that, and then I'll get back to the other point. So I think sometimes sure. that can itself be sort of transformative and, and challenging and transformative. Like, you know, going, I, I said, you know, maybe if you deal with someone from another culture, um, they may have a very different sort of harmonizing or structure to their day-to-day -day experience than you do. Um, but, but so let's say you do meet such a person and uh, maybe it's a schoolmate or something like that. And you like this person. And as you try to get to know them and deal well with them, you come to learn that they do see things somewhat differently from you. And so you have to mm -hmm. start learning how to interact with them in a way that fits with them that can be uh that can be very revealing because through dealing well with them you can start to see uh, biases in your own behavior or, or mm -hmm. why ways that you used to think it was normal to act are not so obvious and and dealing with another person can make your own former behavior kind of questionable, right? Well, mm. so analogously to that, I would say in the situation we're talking about about anxiety and so on, yes, it, it is the case that you're sort of taking apart the song that was playing in your life. Mm. And that might kind of leave you now. And in the moment of anxiety, it's kind of like there's no, there's no music anymore. Like it's just you don't know what to do. Mm. But what I want to say here is 
the idea of building up again new music or something like that i think I think it wouldn't be quite right. I don't think it would be quite the right attitude to say, you know, you're just going to go make that up. You're just going to go compose a new song. I think mm -hmm. what I'm thinking of is more like that ethical experience that it's really like anxiety is putting you in a position where you can experience the world in a way that's a little bit more naked and mm -hmm. put yourself in a position where you're now actually going to try to learn from that world how you should connect with it and, and so on uh, um, analogously to the way that you were going to learn from that other person how to connect with them so i think that anxiety is is a step in getting to that position where you are actually maybe, maybe if i stick with the music thing you're you're actually now ready to listen to the world sort of for the first time rather than kind of imposing a, a structure on it so i do think that pe people do learn to li basically live a new life uh, like as one does after breaking mm -hmm. up when you break up with someone you can't really imagine sort of how to live but it turns out there are different ways to live and, and as you develop another life you know with another person or whatever uh it um, I, ideally it won't just be a repetition of what you did before, right? But you'll you will start to inhabit a new a new kind of way of being in the world and so on. Um, and I think that's a, th a thing that happens with people as they as they go through the kind of process I'm talking about. People learn how to a, a new way of living in the world. Let me let me say one more thing about that. Um, you know, there, there are many times in life, it seems to me, when some of these issues of anxiety kind of predictably come up that and they are situations of growth, you know, when when you're whatever, 13 or something like that, you know, that entering into teenage years, maybe you start going to high school or, you know, higher grades of school or something like that. You know, people often enter into that kind of adolescent life, going through puberty being farther away from the family, like that's can be extremely anxiety producing. It's anxiety producing partially because you're exposed to other people, your, you know, your schoolmates who are on the one hand, very desirable to you. You want to socialize with them. Maybe you want to date them, but they're also like really mean. You know, like they, they can respond to you in ways that make you feel so bad by, by picking on you or by not even noticing you or whatever. Uh, and so that, there it seems to be an adolescent life people are sort of for the first time entering into that domain where they're going to start building their own social world with their own people and they're kind of starting to leave their family behind and there's a lot of anxiety there because the thing that used to give your life its clear structure and meaning the life with your family and the rules of your family doesn't count anymore and you haven't yet learned how to inhabit the world of um, your peers and their perspectives. And initially, that's intimidating and terrifying, or at least it can be. But it's, it's not like the other side of that anxiety is not living in the world of dealing with the perspectives of your peers, right? It, it, you, you will learn how to do that. It's just that the process of doing, doing that involves a lot of growth. So the very same experience that induces anxiety when you experience it as the loss of a world of meaning you used to have, and now you're in this new place and there's kind of nothing, can, will, can gradually be replaced by a whole new way of living that brings a whole new kind of meaning. But, but it's not a thing you're just going to make up. It is rather you gradually learning how to inhabit this world that you'd never really encountered before. And that happens again, uh, you know, probably at young adulthood, people, when they move off to university and really leave their family or, or they get a job or they start a family. Uh, in another book of mine called Adult Life, I, I write a, f a decent amount about the, you know, what we call a midlife crisis, which I think is another similar mm -hmm. thing. It's very common for people, you know, around 45 or 50 or 55 to have a similar kind of crisis because there, you know, they were living with other people, they had their own family, they had their own job and so on, but they, it means 
they'd set up all these things as what their life was about. And they're sort of kind of coming to an end. Like they're, they're, they've done their job now and maybe they're going to retire or at least they've, they've reached, they've succeeded at the things they wanted to succeed at. And that marriage has gone on for a long time. Maybe it's stale now. Their children have grown up and left or whatever. And, and, or maybe their body's starting to fall apart a bit. Like, uh, you know, Hmm. you, you, when you hit 50 and so on, like some things don't work as well. And so you can really feel like all those things you'd counted on as the meaningful structure of your life, just don't cut it anymore. And then there's a new kind of anxiety. And that one, in that book, Adult Life, I talk about, I I find it's quite interesting. Like there, the new reality you have to learn to inhabit is the reality of aging, you Mm. know, and you've been aging all your life. But you didn't have to. It, it, it doesn't uh, prod you in such a, such a striking way as as it does in the the later years, you know. Uh, but so just like teenagers feel anxiety in the context of entering into the world of you know peer pressure, basically, uh, people at fifty experience anxiety entering in the into the world of having to acknowledge their aging and their mortality and their finitude. But it's not like solving that is just getting rid of a bad feeling. It, it's that's going to be solved well when you learn how to um, live as an aging person, you know. Uh, anyway, so that uh, I don't know if that uh, I, I, again went off for a bit, but but that's that's sort of how I think making new music out of the context of anxiety maybe should be understood. Yeah, that, that's really great. One thing that I had another question, but that, that makes me want to ask when you, you, you teach and you write philosophy, does it in writing lots about it? Does it help you personally in your own life? Like in having to articulate your ideas in such fine detail and, and if in to, to others. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, again, that takes us right back to where we started. Um, yeah, I think of the process of the study of philosophy and the process of trying to make sense of my own life is really the same thing. And as I've tried to make sense of my own life, that has allowed me to appreciate a lot in the tradition tradition of philosophy. And as I've studied the tradition of philosophy, that has you know hugely impacted my ability to make sense of my own life. So there's a very vibrant dialogue there. Um, yeah, because I think... I think that philosophy is really the, the tradition of philosophy is, is, as I said, really about trying to understand our world. And so the great works are the works of great insight. And, mm. and so they're great insight about what it does mean to live as a person in the natural world with other people. Uh, th- those are kind of the ba- the main parameters. Like you got to sort of, your people are always dealing with what it is to be a person. We're always dealing with the fact that we're engaged with others, which bring ethical and political issues in tow. And we're always living in a world of nature, which which uh, means we we die, we get sick. It also means we've got to figure out how to get by and get food. So that's where economics and science kind of come out of. Um, mm-hmm. But so all of the writings, it seems to me, all of the great writings are really about understanding more deeply what each of those things what each of those dimensions is kind of about and so it seems to be yeah learning those things um certainly Mm -hmm. deeply impacts me because i'm trying to be a person i try to deal with other people i have to live in a world of nature and and indeed i have to live in a world of nature in the highly cultivated form that has industry and natural science and you know all the rest and i have to deal with other people in the way that has the highly developed form of um governments and different cultures and all all those sorts of things and so and that's part of what you learn about from studying those things too but yeah the the um uh, i think the 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 sort of feedback in both directions from my life into my study of these books and my study of those books into my life is a very direct and powerful and that that I think then has also I hope I, I hope and I believe that has also happened in my teaching right because I understand things in those ways I try to communicate the 
force of these traditional works and these traditional ideas in a way that speaks to people's lives. You know, and, and mm -hmm. uh, I think I think people should find the study of philosophy kind of inspiring, and and I think that has often happened. I've uh, you know taught lots of classes where people have you know, become very excited about the study of philosophy. Lots of my students have gone on to be other philosophy teachers themselves and so on. Uh, and I think that's, that should be the process, right? That, that, that the discipline is kept alive by people who experience it as vibrant and meaningful for their own lives. And that's the thing that needs mm -hmm. to be communicated. Yeah. Thank you. I like that we came full circle, but there's one, maybe one question. Yeah. I wanted to ask, which was sure. just, we talked about music uh, and life being like music. Um, off the air, you talked about being a musician. I wanted to yeah. to ask, what is art to you? And in yeah. this framework, what is art? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's great. I, I mean, and that does connect with lots of things we've said. I, I think of art in, in the broadest level as the way human civilization human cultures try to develop ways to express what they find meaningful. And so I think you can understand, uh, from my point of view, you can understand art much better if you kind of imaginatively go back to the earliest people or proto people, you know, they didn't have, they didn't have our languages, they didn't have all of our stuff around us. And you imagine people, um, just kind of confronting this world and so on. And, and they had to build the things we now take for granted, you know, ways of communicating, ways of expressing and so on. Uh, but I, th I think art is about that. I think art is, is, is like the basic ways we say, or I guess I could say the basic ways we say something. And you got to develop that, you know, and, and mm -hmm. on the basis of, you know, things that happened a long time ago, you know, people started developing ways to express. Once you develop those ways to express, you can kind of live in their resources, you know, and so uh, I think for human beings, that need to develop the way to express like what's going on with us never ends. But we can, we can f ignore that or, or not notice that because we live in a society where that has advanced so much that it feels like, oh yeah, I know how to express things. I know what's going on. And th you know, this relates back to my other points. Like I think we, we grow up learning how to navigate a situation and then we just take it as obvious. That's the way it is. And, you know, and I've been saying, well, we should really learn to question that and, and be open to other possibilities. And that's the same issue then with expression. Like we often can, can fail to recognize that there are continuing issues of trying to say and figure out what things are and what's important because we grow up with all kinds of established ways for doing that already. Um, so, so I think art at that is, is first of all, that kind of, human thing. Uh, and I think that is a thing that is alive in the world today with, you know, real artists are still trying to do that. They're, they're trying to find new ways to say the important things that need to be said, because we live in a world where we rely on ways of making sense of things that have become kind of stale. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's kind of art at the biggest level. For an individual person, uh, I think we we tend to connect with art uh, not initially. Well, actually, maybe sometimes we do connect with it at that grand level. Like sometimes you hear a piece of music or you see a painting or something, and you're mesmerized by it, and it just it, it just takes you into a sort of Oh, I don't know, maybe even a kind of mystical experience or something like you're just in a, you're just sort of locked in a world where uh, everything seems kind of different and, and whatever like that, maybe that, that an experience that I think most people have had that maybe that does connect us to what art was always about where, which is kind of where you realize 
yeah, there's something important here that needs to be expressed, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but we, we often connect to things that way, but sometimes we also connect to things just in the way that a design or a picture or something uh, just strikes us as pretty or in some way compelling. And there, I think it doesn't have to it doesn't have to have so much have a matter uh, air of mystery, although it can, mm. but it can actually be more like perfection. Like sometimes you see something, it's just like, yeah, that's the way it should be. You know, that's like sometimes when you see a, a really, you know, beautiful person or something, that's what's so striking is like, you just can't believe perfection is showing itself, you know, in mm. front of you or something right. like that, you know, or, or a beautiful sunset can be like that. Like, it doesn't seem like it's just, some weird uh, physical effect of air and moisture or whatever and light, but it's like that is meant to be seen. You know, it just seems so mm -hmm. perfect. But I think sometimes our, our experiences of beauty are like that. And so there, maybe rather than drawing up the kind of mystical feeling about trying to express what really matters, sometimes our initial experiences of art are more about something that just seems so right and seems so perfect. And that's interesting just because it kind of um, puts in us that idea of perfection, that idea that there's something the world could rise to or answer to, you know? But anyway, I think I think those those kinds of things are the core experiences behind art. And I think uh, I think everybody experience those, experiences those, and but they don't they don't have to be things that automatically move us to deep contemplation, though they can be. But they're also enjoyable. It's fun to dance. You mm -hmm. dance, you're connecting with the music, you're connecting with other people. You know, so I, I don't mean to be saying anything negative about that. I'm just trying to say what it is that I think uh, really makes us start to think something is art. Um, uh -huh. But anyway. Um, in a person's life, I think art can function at a lot of levels, like there, like it can be a wonderful relief from the tedium of the day to just hear a nice groovy song and dance with people, you know, which is a little bit of that stepping out of everyday life into the world of perfection or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and whether you're playing or listening, um, that is a, a really significant way art can feed our lives. Um, maybe. I don't know, maybe there are some particular posters or paintings or songs that you like, not so much that you're going to dance to, but like maybe they're just ones you hear over and over again, or they're pictures you put on your wall. And maybe that will be a thing that you'll live with all the time. Like just seeing these images where, I don't know, maybe the images kind of inspire you or, or give you a little imaginative world to enter into or something. But, but it seems to me there, there's one level of art that, it's just a, a helpful thing that populates our world. And, you know, and then there are many steps you can move along. Like you can, you can get really wrapped up in it and you can see other people making things that you think are great. And so you want to make things like that. Uh, and maybe that's, you know, that's probably what a lot of people do when they play music or learn how to paint. Like they, they learn how to do well, a thing that people have already done, but it's a rich and rewarding part of life. You know, and there just, there are layers up this uh, up to that point where I began, where it seems to me that people who are great artists are people who are still engaged in that process of sort of helping human culture work out new ways to express things, and so I think at the highest level that's what art is, but it but that same thing speaks to us at the most mundane level too, or maybe I shouldn't quite say mundane, at the most everyday level, mm -hmm. by taking us out of our mundane experiences and giving us a sort of charged environment to work in and so on. Um, but I don't know, that's, so that's like, that's a mm -hmm. few things. I was trying to say something about what I think kind of the core experiences are, what I think it's ultimately yeah. about and some of the different ways it comes up in life. But you know, it's a, it's a big, it's a big yeah, thing, but yeah, that's yeah. kind of the map I have of it. I really like I that. That's it, 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 yeah, no, it's, it's helpful. It makes you think of the, the end bit, especially. It makes you think of uh, art as kind of 
a portal both in like our everyday lives but also in culture like as we were talking about to create new ways of being right um we yep. um you know it's funny also one thing i wanted to to bring up is you talk about how in, in your book bearing witness epiphany about how a child maybe experiences art in different ways to an adult or there is a way in which mm -hmm. There is a, actually a kind of experiencing of art that, as you say, that like it, it, there are different levels of of of, of its prof profundity, right? Um, and and you know, even we talked about anxiety. Sometimes music 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 is something which can be the only the only source of of meaning or, or something which can can spark your taste for the ways in which mm -hmm. life can can be meaningful in that sense. Um, well. I think I don't know if I have anything more really to to, to ask there, um, or in general. So well, this has been great. No, it's great. Let me let me let me ask if you have any um, final comments or things you want to say, and also where people can find you. Yeah, no, I mean I, I don't think I have anything else to say. You've asked uh, you've asked great questions, and I think we've talked about a lot of stuff. Um, uh, awesome. And I appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, people can find me on YouTube. Uh, I've got lots of videos there of of lectures. Um, and I've, you know, written various books. I'm always happy to have people read those. I've, uh, the Bearing Witness to Epiphany is one of a series of three books published by um, State University of New York Press. Um, so there's Bearing Witness to, to Epiphany, Human Experience and Adult Life. And those, mm -hmm. I think, relate very much to this range of topics about, you know, how life works. And I have another book called Sites of Exposure, published by Indiana University Press, which moves more in the direction of politics and also art. So I think people can go to any of those. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, look at my name on the internet. I think they'll find it. Yeah, I'll link all this stuff. All right, awesome. Okay. Thanks, John. All right, okay, thank you very much. Welcome.